Hey everybody, it's good to see you. I hope that you have had a good week and uh, I'm looking forward to us getting in God's Word together and seeing what He has to say to us today. So uh, we've been in a series and actually I didn't know it was a series until I got to looking at the last two weeks and I realized that there was a common thread going through the teaching that I've been doing and the thread is this, it's the harvest. And so now I've kind of backtracked and I've named this series uh, the Harvest Series. And, and what better time to have a series like this than as we're entering into the fall. We talked about last week the big harvest moon that we saw out there. And, and it's just harvest time. And so why not pay attention to what God's Word says about the harvest? And that's what we're doing. So this week we are actually in part Three. So let's do a little review here and, and look at where we've been. Uh, we're talking about how it's important to have fellowship and fellowship, um, breaking bread together, doing church together, doing life together. All that is so important. It's important to have good Christian friends and family that you can uh, just go through life with. But if we're not careful, it can cause us to miss the most important thing. And that most important thing is the harvest. And so in week one, uh, we looked at seeing the harvest. And we were in John chapter four, and we saw how Jesus told his disciples to lift up their eyes and see the harvest. And then last week, we were looking at working in the harvest, and, and the working of the harvest was going, weeping, sowing, and reaping. And now, this week, we're going to be talking about gathering the harvest, and we're going to be in the scripture in John chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, or however you get to God's Word, maybe it's on your phone, or, or device, computer, whatever. But anyway, if you will, go ahead and open up your Bible to John chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 29 through 49. And while you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. See how much you know about God's Word. Who would you say was the first Christian convert? The first Christian convert. Who would you say that is? Well, I think that we find the answer in John chapter 1. And the answer is John the Baptist. And, and so just to get a picture of what I'm talking about here, let's read verses 29 through 34 of John chapter 1. Here's what it says. It says, the next day, John, we're talking about John the Baptist, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So basically, John was the first Christian convert, or you could say the first disciple of Jesus. Now, why do I say that? Because uh, John was a Jew. He already believed in a coming Messiah. That's what Jews believe in. But he had not yet met the Messiah. Once he saw Jesus... He knew and accepted Jesus as the Messiah of the world. Therefore, he was converted from Judaism, the belief of a coming Messiah, to Christianity, the belief that Messiah has come in Jesus Christ. So that makes John the first convert. Now, there's many people who believe in God, but they don't yet know him as Savior. That's how it was with John. And we're talking about the gathering today and how we can be a part of gathering 
the harvest of souls. Those people who, who believe in something, but they don't yet know Jesus, they're the harvest that we need to go out and gather in. So like John, they're looking and they're seeking, but they haven't seen him yet. They haven't been introduced to him yet. You may ask someone if they're a believer, and they may say yes, but to understand what they mean, you have to dig a little deeper. You have to talk about who Jesus is and see if they've met him and made him the Lord of their life. That's what happened to John. He knew that there was a Messiah coming, but he finally saw him. He finally met him. And when he saw and met Jesus, he made him the Lord of his life. That's being converted from Judaism to Christianity. That's becoming a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. Now, let me ask you another question. Once John met and accepted Christ, how do you think his life changed? Well, let's look at verses 35 through 37. It gives us a clue. It says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So this is how John's life changed. He started pointing people to Jesus. The one that changed his life, he wanted other people to have their lives changed. He wanted other people to know who he knew, the Savior of the world. So let me ask you this question. What about you? Are you pointing people to Jesus? Now, there's a simple pattern of gathering the harvest and we see it right here where we was just reading. And so let's start at verse 35 and read a little bit and follow along with me and see if you see what this pattern is. Here's, here we'll start at verse 35. It says, again, the next day, John stood with his, two of his disciples looking at Jesus. As he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Then the two disciples heard him and they followed Jesus. See what happened there? Here's John, who was the first convert, the first disciple, the first believer. And then what does he do? He points other people to Jesus. And what do they do? They then follow Jesus. So there's the pattern. It's as simple as that. The gathering of the disciples follows the pattern of discipleship that starts in the New Testament and continues today. Those who receive someone else's witness becomes witnesses themselves. And, and here's what I'm talking about. Look at verse 40. It says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's brother. And so we see that because John believed in Jesus and, and he spoke to two of his disciples, one of them was Andrew. And because Andrew heard John point out who Jesus is, the Messiah, then Andrew follows Jesus. Now look at verse 41. He first found Andrew, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And there you go. So now um, let's back up a minute. We've got John the Baptist. He he meets Jesus, he uh, follows Jesus, and then he points Andrew, and Andrew starts following Jesus, and then Andrew goes and gets his brother Simon, and Simon starts following Jesus. Now look at verse 43. The following day, Jesus went to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And so once again, 
Philip's uh, walking along the road. He meets Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. Philip follows him. And then he goes and gets Nathaniel and asks Nathaniel to come and see the one whom he's following, the one who is the promised Messiah, Jesus, the Savior of the world. And Nathaniel comes and Nathaniel follows Jesus. So you see that pattern? When people meet Jesus, they're to tell other people about Jesus. When people follow Jesus, they're to get other people to follow Jesus. That's the simple pattern of gathering in the harvest. Think about the Samaritan woman. We studied her a couple weeks ago. She met Jesus at the well. Her, her life was forever changed. She accepted Jesus as her Messiah and Savior. And what does she do? She goes back to town and she brings her whole town to Jesus. And so there's the simple pattern of gathering in the harvest. So how can we be about this gathering of the harvest? How can we be involved in that and be sure that we're part of that? Well, remember in week one of this series how we saw the disciples totally missing the opportunity to be a part of the gathering. Remember that? Apparently, they walked right past the Samaritan woman. So do you remember what Jesus said to them about it when they were questioning him? Well, let's look at John chapter 4. Turn just a couple of pages over to John chapter 4, and we're going to look at a few verses here, starting in verse 27, just to recall what Jesus said to the disciples when they missed their opportunity to be a part of the gathering of the harvest of the Samaritan woman. In verse 27, it says, and at this point, his disciples came, they were coming back from town, they went to get food, Jesus is sitting at the well, he's talking to the woman. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say, here's what I want you to hear. Do not say, there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Remember, that's what we talked about last week, the, the working in the harvest, some sow and some reap, some till up the soil and some plant and some bring in the harvest. And that's what he's talking about here. In verse 37, it says, for in this, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. So, What's the key points to gathering in this passage we just read? Well, there's a few things that are important. The most important thing, lift up your eyes. Open your eyes and look. The harvest is all around you. Jesus says, don't say that the harvest is four months away. Jesus says the harvest is now. And when you look at our world, you know the harvest is now. There's people that need the Lord. There's people that need to be introduced to him. And we're the ones to do it. So don't miss that. That's the work, and Jesus wants you to be involved in the work. He wants you to be sowing the word into others. And for some that have already received the word, like John, it said that he believed, but he was looking, he was seeking, and when he finally saw the Savior, he already knew enough to recognize him as the Savior. 
See, when we are sowing God's word into people's lives, when we are sowing our testimony into their lives, then what it does is it creates a belief in them, an expectation, a looking, a longing. They begin to look for Jesus, and, and then you introduce them to Jesus. That's the gathering of the harvest is when they receive Christ from from your witness, from your words, and, and they come to know Christ themselves. And then what do they do? Then they go and tell other people about Christ, and, and we generate a harvest of souls. That's the most important thing. Now, uh, let's do a little brainstorming. What are some just real and practical ways that we can be about gathering in the harvest? Well, I thought about this, and, and I've come up with several ideas, and, and if you come up with some ideas that we don't talk about right here, I wish that you would put them in the comments below this video. I would love to hear what you're thinking and what works for you, but one of the main things, I believe, is that we have to be a servant. We have to serve others so that they wonder, why, why would they serve me in this way? And they'll ask you that question, why? And it gives you the opportunity to sow the love of Jesus into their lives. So we need to live as servants to others. Not only that, we need to live our life in such a way that people see something different in us. We need to live our life in such a way that our family and our friends will want to know what is it that's different about us. I can tell you that many times uh, throughout my Christian life, I've had friends say, Dollar, what is it that's different about you? Coworkers, what is it? There's something different about you. I've had people say, I want whatever it is that you have. Listen, you have to live a life that, that shines the light of Christ so that others may see. The Bible teaches us that this world is blind in sin. They're dead in sin. And we're to bring the light of Christ to them. That's why we see that process of people who follow Jesus go and bring other people to Jesus because those other people, they don't know how to find him. They don't know how to get there. They're blinded by, by the sins and the cares of this world. And we're to go get them by the hand and bring them to the Savior. And so we need to live our life in such a way that people see a difference in our life and they'll ask us that question, what is different about you? And then you'll be able to tell them about Jesus. You'll be able to bring them to Jesus and introduce them to him in, in hopes that they'll receive him as their savior. You know something else that we could be doing? We could be making friends with unchurched people. I mean, people that you work with that you don't go to church with. Uh, people that you look at their lives and, and there's something obvious, just like your life would be obvious that there's something different about you. A lot of people's lives, it's obvious that they don't have Christ in their life. We need to make friends with those people. We need to be the light in their life. Uh, another thing I thought about is just, just being a witness everywhere you go, just trying to share the name of Jesus in hopes that it would generate a conversation. You, some of you know that I like to buy and sell things. I'm sort of an um, a, uh, amateur picker. And uh, so oftentimes I'll sell something on Facebook and I'll have to uh, meet somebody somewhere to give it to them. And, uh, and I try, every time that I meet someone that's buying something from me, I, I always try to end the conversation like, like this. As a matter of fact, I sold an antique clock last night to a super nice man named John. And uh, we talked for probably 20 minutes. He was a wealth of knowledge. He taught me a lot about antique clocks. And, uh, but then I said, now, John, I'm going to have to go, but I want to change the subject real quickly. And I want to tell you the best news there is. And, and he says, what is it? And, and just about every time that I meet somebody I've never met before, I'll end the conversation like that. And they always say, what is it? Man, people want good news. So I said, John, I want to give you the best news that I can give you. And he says, what is it? I said, Jesus loves you. Do you know Jesus? And he says, yes, I do. My parents are strong believers. They raised me to uh, go to church. And, and I'm thinking to myself, now that's the church isn't it. So I need to dig a little deeper, like I was saying earlier. And I said, but have you ever received Christ? Do you know Christ personally? And he says, yes, I do. 
And so you can just, uh, in your daily life, as you meet people, as you go about your daily business, be sure to bring up the name of Jesus and hope that it'll generate a conversation where somebody might want to know who Jesus is. And then here's, an, here's another thought I had. Why not invite people to lunch? Offer to pay for their lunch. Be generous. People love to be taken to lunch. And, and here's what you do. You say, hey, uh, let's get together for lunch. And they'll go, great. Uh, when are you available? Say, huh, what about Sunday? Could you do lunch Sunday? And they'll probably say, well, sure, I can do lunch on Sunday. And then you say, hey, I've got a great idea. How about I always go to church first? Would you come to and go to church with me? Would you come and go to church with me? And then after church, I'll take you to lunch and I'll buy. I'll even come pick you up. Listen, that's that's a good way uh, to be about gathering in the harvest. Just, that, that's a few ideas I have. Uh, share with me the ideas that you have. I'm sure there's so many I haven't thought about. Well, listen, I, I want to end uh, with a couple of uh, passages of Scripture. This first passage is Psalm 126, verses 5 through 6. I, I shared it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, and we talked about it last week. It became our lesson, our Bible study last week, and here's what it says. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now, let's face it, going out and being a witness working in the harvest sometimes can cause tears. Sometimes it can be challenging. It can be hard. But those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. And this week we're talking about the reaping, the bringing in the, of the harvest. And verse 6 says, He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's a wonderful promise from God's word. And then I, I, I want to share with you Luke 9, 23, and it's what Jesus says to us all. It says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Here's the truth about the harvest, the working in the harvest, and the seeing of the harvest and the gathering of the harvest is, is it takes time. You have to give up some things to be about the Father's business. Uh, you have to change your priorities. You have to change your schedule. You have to be willing to be interrupted by opportunities to sow the seed and to tell people about Jesus. That's what we're called to do. That's what it means to be a true believer. We're so excited about the Savior that we can't help but tell other people about him. And we can't help but work in the harvest and reap the harvest and participate in the rejoicing. And next week, uh, God willing, we're going to be talking about participating in the rejoicing rejoicing of the harvest. So I look forward to sharing that with you. In the meantime, I hope you have a great week. God bless you for just taking a few moments to, to share this Bible study with me. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I just hope you have a good week. God bless. See ya.